This is the Sales Development Podcast, powered by Tenbound, hosted by David Denver. My name is James Bodden, here to introduce episode 206, featuring Melissa Gaglione, enterprise account executive at Live Person and a true sales ninja, as our host David so eloquently puts it. And the episode kicks off with Melissa and David talking about multi threaded communication and going to where their attention is, whether that's your customer, whether that's your prospect, or whether that's your coworkers. The episode rolls right along with Melissa talking about how she fell into sales after spending time as an elementary school teacher and a TV broadcaster. She also shares how she landed at Live Person, a great story for all of those folks that may be interested in getting into sales development that are currently doing something completely different. At the 15 minute mark, Melissa and David talk about her hashtag Mamba mentality and how SDRs can stand out if they want to transition into an account executive role like Melissa did. Look, there is some fantastic tactical advice here. If you're wanting to make that transition, make sure you tune in. Around the 28 minute mark, Melissa gives us video prospecting 101. Now, Everybody listening to this that's involved with sales development at any level must listen to this. This is an absolute masterclass in the way to do video right. And to wrap up the episode, Melissa and David talk about emotional intelligence, some of their plans for the future, and how you can connect with her to continue following her journey. If you enjoy this episode, head over to tenbound.com, leave a rating. But for now, enjoy episode 206 with Melissa Gaglione, Enterprise Account Executive at Live Person. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. This is David Denver, your host. And today we're going to be speaking with the true sales ninja. Yes, that's <laughs> correct. A sales ninja, account executive at Live Person, Melissa Gaglione. Welcome to the show, Melissa. Oh, thank you. I am so happy to be a sales ninja. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like, I don't know if I should call you Leonardo, you know, Michelangelo, you tell me, I, I don't know. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, first, let me say this, like, you know, I must say it's been awesome to getting to know you the past few weeks. And, you know, we've had those Zoom chats, email exchanges, and then also like LinkedIn messages. So talk about great multi-channeling yourself. I mean, I can see that you have just straight wizardry. I don't even know if I even said that right, but you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) Yes, yes. Isn't it interesting? It's like we even multi-thread in real life. Yes. So we should be doing it with our prospects. I mean, when you think about it, I text my friends, I Snapchat my friends, yes. I slide into their D- I even LinkedIn my friends, to yeah. be honest. Like, I, I know. I know. Like even a boss, sometimes I'll like just send them a LinkedIn instead of a Slack. Like if I see something on LinkedIn, I'm like, oh, you need to check this out. Boom. LinkedIn message instead of Slack. Yeah. Yeah. But it also kind of depends on, you know, where they are. So some people that I work with, I'm not going to hit them up on LinkedIn, but I know I have to hit them up on like the G chat and others. I know I have to email. Isn't that weird? You start to get used to like your coworkers and you're like, okay, well, let me go to this channel for this mm-hmm. and this channel for this person, because I know that this person lives on LinkedIn. So I can always share things with them, but it's the same thing. Like we do it with our friends. We do it with our coworkers and we do it with our prospects. Yes. And the fact that what's the saying, go to where your prospects are, right? Like whatever piece or social media that they're on, if that's Instagram, if that's even Facebook, I know a lot of folks within the D2C space, even e-commerce, like you can get a hold of some folks easier on those type of platforms. So yeah, it is super interesting. That's for sure. Yeah. Facebook, Twitter, wherever, you know, what we do here. So at live person, it's actually, it's like our tagline in a sense, we always tell customers or, you know, potential customers or prospects, you know, Hey, you need to meet your customers where they are because here at live person, we sell conversational AI. We help you be connected to your customer, whether they're on the side of the road and they need help, or maybe they're sitting on their couch on Facebook, you know, whatever channel your customer lives on is where that brand should be communicating. So 
of course, here at Live Person, you know, once I started really learning about, you know, all of this stuff, it's like, well, I have to meet my prospects where they are too. True that, true that. And maybe we'll take a step back and let's kind of start talking about who Melissa really is, right? <laughs> like what we got is I love your passion. I love your energy. I love your story. And I think our listeners today would absolutely love to get to know you the way that I've really enjoyed getting to know you. Yeah. I mean, it's been a really wild journey. I always tell people I make no sense, but I do make sense. You know, I make no sense as to how I got here, but I'm really proud of every decision that I've made and how I've accomplished these things in such a short amount of time. I'm still in my 20s. I did all of this in my 20s. And by all of this, I mean, as some background information, I changed careers a couple of times, right? So I was a elementary school teacher for a couple of years. And then I jumped to being a on-air news reporter in Texas. And then I jumped, actually, I shouldn't say jumped. I actually like really fell into sales. By that, I mean, they didn't give me a job to be a producer. They threw me in the sales department. And that was my first, you know, time I was was really in sales. And I was selling corporate events right before the pandemic. So when the pandemic hit, I was like, okay, I got to pivot. And Live Person was number one on my list of companies that I wanted to go to or like join. You know, I had some friends here, so reached out to them, learned about the company and, you know, they gave me a shot and, you know, not having SaaS experience before and being able to go into live person was a true, like, it was really a blessing, but it was also like, okay, Melissa, like this is some real stuff, girl. Like, I don't know exactly how this all happened, but like, this is my opportunity. So like, I really need to crush it. This could really change my life. And I remember I was crying to one of my friends who referred me to live person. And I was like, you just changed my life. Like, you know, me as a person, right? He knew who I was, but he knew my work ethic from like college, of course, but not in the sales environment. So he was really just trusting that, you know, I was going to be me and do this well, but he really did give me an opportunity that I feel, you know, put me where I'm supposed to be. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And it's like, kind of touches me close to my heart. Because like knowing that an individual, they put their brand, their name on the line and for you to execute and for you to let that individual know that, hey, I'm not going to let you down. Mm -hmm. And that right there, there's a strong why. And with you already being a hardworking individual and like having that strong why of like when someone steps out and says, hey, you know what? I believe in you. Like you carry that on your shoulders. You're like, now it's time to go beast mode. Like yeah. I was already in beast mode, but now it's like, you're going m M&M mode where it's like one shot, one opportunity. I'm not going to let it slip. And I'm going to make my friend, my mentor, I'm going to show them that like, Hey, that was the best decision you made. Yeah. I just really wanted to make him proud. And I really wanted him to be like, yeah, I brought Melissa in, you know, like, yeah, yeah. yeah." (laughs) Oh, and that's so awesome. And like, even getting to know you, I would have thought, you know, with you being an enterprise account executive, I would have thought you've been in the seat for a long time because not only, you know, the framework, you speak it so well, like from the SDR mode to all the way to account executive, like. What did that look like? Like, I hear the story, you got the chance, now you executed, but what were those things as an SDR where you're like, oh my gosh, I need to figure out the CRM. What about this? What about this sales engagement tool? Like, how did you compartmentalize it all, put it together and crush? Wait, so I've never seen Salesforce before. I came to live person. I never saw outreach before. I had LinkedIn sales navigator from my other job because I actually bought it myself and was like, guys, we need this. And so eventually I actually, I don't even know if they gave me a license. I might've paid for it myself. I don't really remember, but anyway, it worked when I came here, 
it's funny because I didn't exactly know what an SDR was. I just knew I wanted live person. Like I just knew I wanted live person and I wanted this opportunity. I wanted to work for this company. It was an amazing, cool company that cares. And they do like the, we are the number one AI company in the world. Like what? I don't know how I got here, but I did. And so when I joined, it was like, okay, like I really don't know much, but that's okay. And when you don't hide from that, it can be really powerful because I could have sat there and been, oh, you know, I got my education in education (laughs) and teaching. That's not helping me now. Like, well, you know, I'm, yeah, I got my, I was a news reporter. (laughs) That's not helping me now. But I didn't look at it like that. Instead, I was like, okay, well, what did I learn as a teacher? What did I learn as a news reporter? What did I learn when I was selling and producing corporate events? And how can I take those things and make them like my superpowers here? And they totally became my superpowers. So even though I joined here, not knowing much, really not knowing much, I had to learn Salesforce. I had to learn outreach. I had to learn Lead IQ and Zoom Info and all these amazing technologies that we have. And again, even though those technologies were new to me, I knew I had to make them into my superpower. So I spent so much time looking up additional videos, how to use outreach, of course, but not just like how to, then I went into like next level stuff. And I started to really optimize exactly what I was doing on outreach and what I was doing, you know, with all the technologies talking nicely together. There were a lot of things that I brought in that were different from what other people were doing. A lot of different resources a lot of different mediums, you know, because I was a news reporter, I wasn't afraid to use video. The first video that I sent out was just a raw clip that I took on my phone. It was inspired because we were doing voice notes. And I was like, let's amp this up, you know, let's, let's amp up these voice notes on LinkedIn. And so I sent like a quick video and that's how I booked my first meeting. And I was stoked. Like I was like, okay, I'm totally onto something. And At the time, my director was so excited and he was so like, this is the future. He made sure that we got Vidyard. So we did like a pilot program for Vidyard. I started sending out these videos that I would send to prospects to, but I would send them to like the C-suites in my own company, like the VPs of strategic selling. And I would send them these videos and be like, what do you think? Like, how can I do better? And one, they thought it was awesome. And two, they would start to kind of help me with like my mess, like what I was saying, you know, and the message that I wanted to portray. So, I mean, really what it comes down to is that I didn't know anything, but that didn't stop me. You know, it's all personal development. Nobody really goes to school for sales. And when you realize that you're like, okay, we're all at the same start line. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. You're taking so many bits and pieces, right? Like it was an awesome thing to hear that you are leveraging what you learned as a teacher, Mm -hmm. compiling that with the other aspect as a reporter, like you're putting it all together and then learning the other side of things, the sales tech stack, really some of the messaging sequences, one-to-one messages compared to -to Mm one-to-many going out and reaching out to different folks internally. And That is just completely brilliant. Like that would actually probably would have terrified me when I first started probably sending out videos to the higher, you know, to the C-suite right on. Like that is so awesome that you're like, you know what, I'm just going to go for it. And it almost could have felt like you were getting exposed. Like if you were sending these videos and it's like, let's just say they were terrible, which obviously they weren't. (laughs) I mean, they were pretty bad in the beginning. (laughs) (laughs) But to take that feedback, like to actually be a student of the game, also known as hashtag Mamba mentality, like you wanted to study the film, you wanted to get better. And that a lot of people today, at least what I've seen, some just hope that if you throw folks in a sequence, you get a response, you book a meeting and that's it. And so what would you tell the SDRs that are looking to make that jump from an SDR to AE and really 
how you're going to stand out to your organization. Like, what were those things that you did besides the fact of the video, which I think is brilliant to your Mm C-suite, but what would you tell them? I mean, there's so many things. (laughs) Well, we'd love to hear them. (laughs) Okay. So I'll I'll go through it all. So many things also that I personally did, but also things that I've seen other people do. So number one, like you have to master the role, Mm -hmm. right? You can't go in being, I'm an SDR, but I want to be an account executive in six months. Like no one's going to take you seriously. You have to prove yourself and you have to like, it stinks that you have to prove yourself, but you do like, it's not an easy task to make this jump. And you really have to be smart about how you're strategically placing yourself. I mean, to be honest, that's literally enterprise sales. It's being strategic and moving through the corporate environment. So you have to do the same thing as the SDR. You are the product you are selling yourself. And so to start off, if you jump in there and you're like, I want to be an account executive in six months, like, this is what I want to do. Like, oh, okay, well, let's see. Like, okay, like, good luck. Like, blah, blah, blah. You have to prove yourself first. I did make it clear what I wanted at an appropriate time after I spoke to all different departments. I spoke to the account executive team, multiple people, multiple people you know, not just one person. I talked to the CSM team. I talked to the SC's team. I talked to the account managers team. Like I just, I wanted to really figure out where I was going to go next after I needed to figure out what I was working towards as an SDR. You know, what is the end role that I wanted to go to? So after I spoke to all those people and really started to understand each of the roles and what they do and the incentives behind it, the day in the life of, that was when I really started to make my decision as to like where I fit. And everyone fits in some place different. You know, not everyone is going to go SDR to AE. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was pretty obvious for me because I love the chase. You know, I love the, it's like I'm a detective you know, I still get to use my reporting detectiveness because I used to call myself a really nosy reporter. Because <laughs> I, I, I just am nosy. <laughs> I absolutely love that. Like I always described the SDR role as a private investigator. Yeah. Right. Like a reporter, and you can almost be. And we talked about the ninja thing earlier, but you're like April O'Neil, right? You're reporting the news, but really just becoming curious. So it sounds like you're curious, George's sister. Mm, yeah. The little mo- the little monkey, like that was something I used to tell my SDRs to cut out two different pictures. One curious George, because when you're actually talking to someone on the phone and either if they're pushing you off the phone to get curious, ask one more question. What's the worst, like, what's the worst thing you do hang up on you? And then two, yeah. a honey badger. So if you've seen YouTube, people that probably have seen it go viral, but like the honey badger don't care. Right. The honey badger just is going to get it done and is just going to execute. And it sounds like, sounds like you're a honey badger. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> We're just going for it. We're just taking it day by day and, and doing, you know, the best that we can always, but just to backtrack a little bit. So I know I mentioned, you know, you do want to set the expectation of where you want to go and how you're going to get there. If you do have a time frame in mind, make sure that it's realistic, but you have to, you do have to let people know that you want that role. Otherwise, if you just have your head down and all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's been two years. Is it time for my promotion? They're like, what? Like, <laughs> it's time for your promotion. Like you need to make it. I, and everyone knew that I wanted to be promoted at that time. Like everybody knew to the point that my SVP of sales was like, Hey, Melissa, isn't it time for your promotion? And I was like, yes, it is. (laughs) Funny. You bring bring that up. (laughs) Yeah. It's actually exactly to the day. Like, can you believe it? So just making it very clear what you want appropriately, kindly smart. So then once you determine what you want and where you want to go, you need to start building those allies. You need to know, okay, well, who are the people that have the magic wand that turn SDRs to AEs or that turn SDRs to CSMs? Who has that magical power? And of course, I knew the three, four people that have that power. 
And, you know, I really wanted them to be impressed by me. Not braggy. You don't want to brag, but you want them to be impressed in the sense that the people around them are saying, Melissa's doing great, you know, and they start to kind of chirp in their ear a little bit, you know, they start to listen to their people and they're hearing like, oh, that girl, Melissa, like she's making these videos, like, oh, she helped break into like the crypto space, like, oh, all this stuff. And they start to hear those things. So you start to build allies that are surrounding those people and you got to get people to buy in and believe in you. You can't say like, I'm going to be an account executive, like that's it. Like you really have to prove yourself at that point. Cause if you're going to do it, your actions have to match what you're saying. Absolutely. And like, did you take or build some type of a business or a use case for yourself to get not just a promotion, but like when you go into these meetings and I know I had to do this myself as I climbed the corporate ladder is not only did I share screenshots of, you know, different dashboards to be able to show my worth, like Obviously they knew that, but like, if you ask for a certain amount of money or like a dollar amount, like they want to know specifically, okay, like, let's go back and talk about what you've done thus far. Like, did you put something together to really show that? Or was it just like more organic? I'm going to be honest. I think I did such a good job at making them want to promote me that they gave me everything that I wanted. Nice. You know, yeah. Like I didn't have to do a crazy, they knew my numbers, you know, they knew I was on the top of the leaderboard. They knew I was doing things beyond just SDRing. It was crazy because I actually felt like I was doing the SDR role for like towards the end, like 30% of my time was SDRing. And the rest of the time was I was, you know, maybe 10% was preparing for AE. I was still even doing 30%, I was still hitting my quota and everything like that. But then the other part of it was that we were my amazing, when I was an SDR, my amazing account executive, who is a strategic director here at Live Person, who is, everyone needs to talk to her. She is a superstar. And when I met her, I was like, this girl's amazing and I can learn so much from her. And she brought in a really big crypto client. And at that moment, we were like, okay, we need to get more. We need to build out this vertical. So together, we launched the crypto vertical for a live person. And we were trying to, we didn't have much like marketing materials at the time. We knew we could help these brands. We knew that there was so much that we can help with. It was really painful for them. We knew that. Anyway, so we were having difficulty going in cold. So, you know, she was like, let's just have an event. And so since I was in events prior, I was like, let's do it. So me and her had an event. We had two events and we had the C-suite, CEOs, COOs from like the biggest crypto brands and NFT companies in the world. And this was still kind of toward, this was towards the end of the pandemic, you know, like testing all that stuff, vaccines were out. So like people were finally like starting to come out, but it was still an ask. You know, it was an ask to get people to go to San Fran or New York City to like all meet up. But the events were so successful. We have a really great crypto vertical. And even my CEO, Rob, just launched something with consensus called Village DAO, which is the very first. It is a decentralized customer care So it's really, really cool. So all because of these, you know, starting off because my account executive believed in this vertical, like now we have products that surround this vertical. It's amazing. It's amazing. That is so amazing. And like decentralized customer care, like I'm a crypto nerd myself. So I absolutely loved hearing that. It made me think like, all right, Decentraland, right? Like I'm thinking Decentraland, I'm thinking the virtual you know, casino, I'm thinking about, you know, the future. And obviously anybody that's in crypto, they could be very sad at this moment by even us talking about it due to the (laughs) fact that the crash happened. And now it's starting to pick back up slowly, but we're in the bear season. But I think what you're doing is building, you're building this back up, you're building to the point where when crypto does go back to the moon, and that's 
not financial advice, that you're positioning yourself to really be in a good seat for yourself personally, because I'm assuming that, you know, you have shares and some other things associated being an account executive. So good for you. And I'm actually going to offline, of course, off the show, I'm going to go check this out because yeah. centralized like customer care, that sounds so cool. It's so cool. And really, I mean, all I did, like, I really, this is them, you know, all I did was just help in the beginning, but once that door opened, like they just went for it. And it's so beautiful to see that I had a very small piece in just starting, just helping the spark start a very small piece, right? I was an SDR at the time, but it's really exciting to see that, you know, you can be creative, you can do things differently. And again, you guys got to talk to this girl, my account executive, you got to talk to her. She's amazing. You're going to have to drop the name because I've heard it a couple of times now. And I'm kind of curious because I'm going to connect with her right now on LinkedIn. Oh, it's Netta Goldberg. You have to connect with her. All right, Netta. I'm going to connect with you, but you're going to hear this probably two and a half weeks later. You'll be like already connected with you, dude. But, you know, taking one step back, because I think we're on to something pretty cool here is talking about the video prospecting, right? Like, so let's pretend somebody was in your shoes being a teacher coming in to become a sales development rep, or they're coming from, I don't know, becoming a server or a bartender. Mm-hmm. And they're a little bit afraid to start this video, like doing some video prospecting. So there's a two part question. So number one, Can we just get down to the basics of step one? Is there a posture? Like, let's get down to like the 101 video prospecting. I think the listeners would absolutely love that. Yeah. Okay. So 101. Yep. Video prospecting. Okay. First, please write a script. (laughs) I hear so many people that just go on these tangents on Vidyard and it's like three minutes long. You have to write out a script. It's almost like it would literally be as if you just wrote an email and didn't reread it and just sent it, you know, like you just did in one shot. So you have to pre-plan and write out the script. So number one, (laughs) just Let's start there. Let's let's write it down. <laughs> yeah. Two is that use some sort of teleprompter. There's a teleprompter app that you can download. Vidyard, I, I believe that they have something that you can use the teleprompter for. I use the app because I like that it makes the way that it's set up. My eyes look at the camera instead of like looking down and reading the words. Correct. And that to me is a big difference. You know, like you're trying to connect with someone, you want to really look at them. You don't want it to seem like you're reading something. So I like the teleprompter app for that because it it looks very clean and and nice. So write it down, use a teleprompter. Appearance is everything. I actually have these shirts and I wear the same shirt every day, just different colors, just because it's appropriate. Like it's my little work uniform that I wear. So, and it's funny because I mean, I can film half the video one day and like, I have the same shirt. I could just wear the other shirt tomorrow. Like, yes. <laughs> kind of funny. Like, I love it. Um, <laughs> but you want to like, of course, look very like professional, things like that. So having good lighting, of course, is important. You want to frame yourself nicely. This is called a face frame. So making sure that you are in the middle of the screen, or if you're going to be adding any graphics on the left hand or right hand side, maybe you'll want to move yourself over if you're going to show them something. So I think that that is, oh, and tones. We need to talk tonality. Let's do it. So everyone's tones are going to be different. I think tones really important. So if you're calling out a problem, you can't be mean. (laughs) Like you can't be like, Oh, your chat sucks. Like you can't be mean. Like you have to be nice and your tone has to match it. So it has to be a more firm tone because you're telling them something that might be hard for them to hear, but it still has to be uplifting. So you need to practice your tones. You need to practice your delivery. When I was a news reporter, I would drive in the car and I would practice 
random things. I would just be driving and talking about any random story that I would make up. And I would just practice my tones, like just like this. When you're making videos, have your tones down, have your tones practice. Because if you're going in saying, hi, I'm Melissa, and I went on your website and your web chat didn't respond to me, they're going to be like, who is this girl? Like, what? You need it to really match the story of what you're telling. So I think tone is really important, but you also don't want to be this like wall. The whole beauty of video is that people get to see your personality and they get to see who you are. They get to connect with the seller. So yes, we want to manage our tones that match what we're saying, but we also still want to be ourselves. So I share my videos out and another account executive could do the exact same thing as me, but it's going to look really different. Because we're different people, just like our discovery calls are different, or just like when we do our cold calls, like I cold call differently than the other person. And we could use the same exact script, but it's going to sound different. So make it yourself, make it yours. You know, this is your time to shine. This is your time to let your personality come through and like people buy from people. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think the other aspect to prospecting or video is within the prospecting, like what touch typically do you do that in, right? I mean, is it the phone call? Is it email? Is it in mail? You're not getting a response. Then you hit them with the video. Like I've heard so many different ways that people end up prospecting. I found the video very helpful. I think it's underutilized. It's not leveraged enough by SDRs. So we'd love to hear like your feedback there of like what touch that you use the Mm -hmm. video. But yeah, I think that the listeners would absolutely love to hear that. Well, I think it's underutilized because it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It takes deep thought, right? You're being strategic. You have to be very smart about what you're saying. And often a lot of people fail with it. And the reason why I say fail, maybe not yet. The reason why I say fail is just because they do maybe two, three, four, and they're like, oh, this doesn't work. This doesn't work for me. You know, people are so quick to be like, no, that doesn't work for me. That's not my channel. I'm going to stick with email or, you know, oh no, like, I don't like cold calling. Like I never book a meeting on it. I like email or, you know, whatever it may be. And you really don't know until you do it for like months. (laughs) Like you just have to do it for months and you have to keep doing it and sending out more videos and being reflective of, you know, what are the videos that you're sending are they working? Are they getting opened or not? Like it really is this big science experiment. And that was the approach that I took when I started making videos, because look, if I was going to spend time making a video, I need to make sure that it converted. Plus I was in the pilot. So I really needed to make it convert because I wanted my company to keep Vidyard. (laughs) So I was like, I need to make this work because like, they're not going to have it if it doesn't work. So I need to make this work because I love this tool. So I think that that's why people just stop with it. They're like, it's uncomfortable. It's awkward. They don't know what to say. You know, nobody likes to watch themselves after it's so cringy to see a video of yourself afterwards. And if you get over that cringe, like, please get over that cringe. It's nobody's looking that closely. I had to learn that in reporting. (laughs) No, that's awesome. And like, you know, one of the things that I'm still trying to wrap my head around is the fact that, I don't know, different SDR managers may or may not like their reps spending as much time on the one-to-one video prospecting because that could take away Mm -hmm. if there is a manager that is more of a dashboard micromanager, they're looking at dials, calls, if SDRs are deep into the weeds of trying to put a video together and they're not executing it quickly, that could put the SDR in a tough spot, right? Because if they're not executing on the video and getting, you know, converting, right, then they're going to have tougher one-on-one. So like, what is your overall thought about, you know, yes, if you're green to creating prospecting videos, like do you need a manager that completely supports you? Well, because you know what I'm talking about, right? Like yeah. it could be a really nasty place, like come middle of the month and you are not even close to hitting your quota and you're still trying to push out these videos. I mean, tell me your thoughts behind that, Melissa. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm very fortunate that I came from or that I'm in an organization that, I mean, we're innovative. We're really cool. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I can see that. We do cool stuff. So like this doing video, like it's so on brand for us. Like it's just so on brand. It's different. It's cool. We have a product that we need to show that's kind of hard to understand in an email. Our product is perfect for video, but you know, I needed to make sure that I was going to hit quota. So there was a balance, you know, while I was figuring this whole thing out, there was a balance and it was, okay, I still need to hit my KPIs and let me do one video a week. Sometimes I couldn't do that one video, you know, sometimes I just couldn't, but until I was able to prove myself, like this converts, that's what I had to do. And either way, like you can't just make videos, like you have to do all the channels, right? You have to leverage all the channels and all different types of mediums, whether that's leveraging video and maybe you're also sending pictures and gifts and you're using Sendozo and you're sending them coffee and like all different things. You're hitting them up on Twitter. Like you just have to keep, you have to do everything. So you can't just be like, I'm only going to make videos and only make videos because if that doesn't convert, then like, Ooh, that's, that sucks. So it was definitely a fine balance of, you know, doing that you have to, and you also have to be reflective and real with yourself. Like if these aren't converting or if I've made a video each week and all three of those weeks, they didn't convert. Why, you know, is it your thumbnail what channel are you sending it in? Are they even looking at your email? Is it early in the sequence? Is it towards the end of the sequence? Like how personalized is it? Is it really long? Is it too short? You know, you have to really analyze and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, so like if we were to break it down back to the 101, Mm -hmm. would you advise SDRs to create these videos after hours so they can focus like until you've talked about proving it out, which I love. It's the beta test. Stay focused maybe at what your manager's wanting, obviously KPIs of like calls, emails, in mails, you know, adding additional prospects within your ICP, et cetera, and then create the videos and mix that in. Or like, what's your advice? I'm like getting it started, slowly bringing that to your current process or just go for it and let the cards fall as they may. Yeah, I will actually, I will never tell anyone to work extra hours. I don't believe in it. I believe in firm boundaries. You know, I want to be with my family after hours. And sometimes, yes, you do have to work more. Of course, of course. But if you're used to that and you're doing that all the time, like I feel bad, like, that's not fair. Like you have your certain times of your life where you really have to hustle, like for sure. And if this is an appropriate time for you, then sure. But I really think that if you plan your day and if you're very strategic with your time, you can make a video a week and hit your KPIs. Agreed. Agreed. And I think it would be great, like, to be able to give an example. So let's pretend we're talking about X, Y, and Z company. Mm -hmm. what's your first approach? Are you making a phone call first? Are you sending a video first, then follow up with an email, then hit a voicemail, obviously not making a call to action because those typically don't get results, which at least that I've found it's more, Hey, I know you're super busy. You don't need to give a call back that type of a voicemail. Like I'd love to hear your multi-channel on how to incorporate video prospecting. Yeah. So first I need to understand this account. I sell software that's for customer care could be used for marketing could be used for you know their app anything like that so i need to understand this company inside and out i need to go through the experience maybe i'll buy something online and return it and see you know what their experience is like you know i want to be a customer first and especially when I'm going after retail. Healthcare is a little bit harder. You know, you start to read things on Glassdoor and Reddit. Like you really try to get an understanding of like what this company is and where the pains are. So first identify the pains that you can solve for, you know, that align with what you're selling. After that, now it's time for us to find the perfect people. I call them perfect people because not everyone is perfect. 
they're not. You're really, in all honesty, you only need one person to say yes. Mm-hmm. You just need one. And so who is most likely going to say yes to you? The champion. So we need to find that person. <laughs> Are you talking more so about a champion, get them on board than oh, for yeah. other decision makers? So I try to look for champions or change makers. And the way that I do that is I look on LinkedIn. I look to see if they've spearheaded any prior initiatives in the past. I Google them. I try to see, you know, and I have different booleans that I'll use. I'll put their name in and I'll put in like, you know, messaging or automation or AI or something like that. And I'll try to search and see what articles serve up. Maybe they've done something in the past. Like I'm digging, like I'm digging for these people. I'm looking on YouTube. I'm trying to see if there's any podcasts. I'm going through transcripts. Like I'm a monster. I'm on their Twitter. (laughs) You know, your customers in and out, like your top 15, let's call it your top 15. You know your top 15 better than you know your dog. Like, right. I mean, yeah, really. I can tell you which of my prospects like ice cream and which ones don't. Like, <laughs> I love that. I love that. I mean, do you have an Excel spreadsheet of being like, all right, this person's a sports fan. Maybe you went on their Instagram, their Facebook <laughs> for your top folks within your eyes. You can, you can certainly write it down. I mean, I hate to say that I remember, but like, I do remember, and I remember like weird things about people because those things stand out, you know, yeah. like those little things at the end, like, you know, I know this person doesn't like ice cream. So like, would love to talk over coffee, not ice cream or something like that. Like, you know, like you start to incorporate like those little things, but I mean, to backtrack, yes, I look for the perfect person and I look for things about them that, you know, make them unique. Maybe they like lava lamps. I have a lava lamp. I've literally used that before. So I try to find, you know, things about them, but also see if they are my champion, if they are that change maker, if they have the power to do it, if they've done things like that before, Or my favorite is if they said that they were going to do it. If they said, you know, in some article, yeah, we're going to transform our e-commerce messaging. We want to have more channels available for our customers. And I look on their website and nothing has been done. Why? Yes. You are like, you're doing the extra work. You're doing the screenshots. You're looking, I mean, with being in like thinking in the e-commerce space, at least if they're talking about being customer Focus and they have a 1 800 number up at the top, right? And you're trying to sell something, either text or messaging or whatever, that might be a good time. I mean, obviously, using tools like Built With to kind of see what their stack is already, mm-hmm. but to be able to find a champion, right? And in this case, you, you mentioned you like lava lamps. How cool would it be? And I'm sure you've already done this. You bring your lava lamp into your prospecting video, which then it's like your prospects are telling you what they like. You're in the middle of their brain. Like there is the intellectual side and then you're just like playing in the middle, which is their emotional intelligence. And if you can speak to them, that is really going to get them like curious, like, okay, I don't know if your product can help me at this point, but you've created not only value, but you've built some rapport, you've done your research. And that's why people will give you time, that human interaction. Yeah. People really respect it because people aren't like, they're not so free with their time and they shouldn't be, you know, our time is precious. Why would anyone, you know, hop on a call with someone that, you know, they feel they felt pressured into taking or tricked or, you know, they weren't excited about, I want my prospects to join the call with me excited. And I think they are like, I feel really good about it. I really do. So definitely researching, understanding this person, understanding their core values. Like I know I go to the extreme with those things, but in a very thoughtful way, I want to be thoughtful with it, not creepy, but thoughtful. And so then once I go through, right, the customer experience, and now I understand, you know, the perfect people that I want to reach out for, I need to now tell this story, but I need to understand it too. So for example, right, I'll look at their web traffic and I'll say, wow, their web traffic has doubled in six months. I wonder why. Let me do some more research. Oh, I see they've acquired four companies this year. Whew, their volumes must be huge. Let me see how many people they're hiring in customer service. Wow, 30 open positions. They're throwing bodies at this problem. They could be leveraging AI, but they're throwing bodies at it. So all these bodies at you know 40K a year, how much are they planning on spending just to handle the volume? So you start to understand the story 
and you start to understand, okay, well, who really cares about this? Obviously the person who's stuck with hiring 20 people, you know, like they're frantic, they're not thrilled about it. You know, let me try to save them. Let me throw them some sort of like life vest, like, Hey, you don't need to keep going down this route. However, if you do, if you do keep throwing bodies at this, it's just going to be this, you're just going to keep spending money and having more people that you need to have over. Let's help your agents, you know, not get rid of them. We don't replace agents. We help them manage more conversations at once. Mm -hmm. That's brilliant. I mean, you know, you can do that on LinkedIn, obviously look at jobs, right? You Mm -hmm. can see the growth, the analytics within sales navigator. And then also if you want to do the triple threat, you can also look at like indeed, right? Like if you're, or so many different things, because you can get information by going to LinkedIn, learning about your prospect. But like, if you're confused about what they actually do and what's in it for them, and they don't have their, like, they don't have their daily responsibilities or what their, you know, big rocks are for the quarter on LinkedIn. I mean, you can just Google what's the responsibilities or and gen, you know, marketing or marketing manager or VP of marketing, or you know what I'm saying? Where you can really speak to them by understanding that. I literally have Glassdoor open, like on one of my tabs open right now, because I was looking at an account and I was digging through Glassdoor because I wanted to know, okay, well, what are the, from the ground level, like, what are they experiencing? What are the agents? What are their pains? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this from all angles and I'm super stoked. I mean, I think you and I will definitely have a fireside chat to dig at more of this. Maybe we could do some type of a series about it because you have such, I don't even have the words because you not only are just such an amazing person, but you really have a big heart and someone that is emotionally intelligent to be able to care about your prospects because you, number one, you genuinely do. And then on top of that, you use this PI type of investigator type of, you know, reporter type of a thing and build that together. And then the teacher aspect, I don't know if I should nickname you, right? Like I'm starting to think, I'm like, do I start calling you the professor? Like (laughs) you're just straight dropping knowledge, hashtag whoa. Like, yeah, (laughs) yeah, that happened.com backslash. Yeah, Melissa. So, I mean, there's just so many things we could continue to talk about, but I mean, I know for the, you know, sake of time, I just am so grateful for you to come on the show today. You just continue to inspire me just knowing that you are to take your craft so seriously and you are not content. Like you want to get better every single day. And when you are at the very top, you'll still be curious about trying to like go another head. Like, how can I get to the CEO? How can I be the board of directors? Like it's never enough. That's one thing I really, really like about you, Melissa. Just love and love to level up. <laughs> That's awesome. Really <laughs> That's awesome. And I'm sure I'll see you on the moon sometime now. Oh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Nin- I went from a ninja to a professor to a astronaut on yeah. this call. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you legitimately got called everything on a call. I mean, maybe I should like add lawyer too. I don't know. But <laughs> once again, Melissa, thank you so much for coming on the sales development podcast. Super thrilled to continue to get to know you more and, you know, have an awesome weekend. And yeah, just thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.